All right, welcome back to the Crimson Flag Podcast, where we bring you a class-conscious analysis of historic and current events which are pertinent to the international working class movement. All right, so today we are joined by a professor of economics at Riverside College, author and YouTuber, Dr. Asitar Bear. How's it going today, Dr. Bear? Good. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, one of the main reasons we wanted to um, interview Dr. Bear here today is, well, he made a tweet, I believe it was on June 26th, and in this tweet, he gave a what I would describe as a pretty nuanced position on Stalin. And sure enough, um, it went viral. Stalin was actually trending that day, and it led to Fox News actually releasing an article on him the next day. So... I thought what we can maybe do is I'll just read um, the first part of your thread here that sparked off this whole thing. And um, then we can hear from Dr. Bear. So he said, people say I idolize Stalin. Not true. I hold a fair and balanced view. The man was neither savior nor saint, but he was at once a very successful revolutionary, a great contributor to Marxist theory, and said to be a great listener and collaborator during discussions. So, yeah, that's the tweet that sparked it all off. So uh, what I was mostly wanting to hear is, um, you know, did you expect for this to get so much publicity? You know, were you expecting this tweet to uh, make it to Fox News and everything? How did that how did that happen? Yeah, I mean, you know, people have to understand that, you know, I I retreat to my villainous den where I, you know, plot worldwide revolution and you know, I, I can make whatever tweet I want go viral. You know, I mean, I just I just wait for the right time. You know, <laughs> I mean, you know, I do lots of posts, and um, I mean, I think I'm. I guess I should back up a little bit. Okay, so I've been on Twitter for a long time, um, but I haven't always been very open about being a communist. You know, I've been mostly pretty closeted about it. You know that. I mean, I've been open as a Marxist, right? Like, but I think the way the way that the politics are in academia is it's it's acceptable, though it puts you in a minority position to say that you're a Marxist, you know? You're encouraged to be like, okay, yes, you read Marx and whatever, right? Because Marx is part of the the you know, is an important part of Western thought, right? So you know, oh yes, you read that, but I don't like labels, you know, like that, that, especially when it comes to anything that is Marxist or, you know, pro, you know, working class in any way, right? Um, so, you know, there's a, there's already a kind of a hesitancy, but if you say, you know, not only am I a Marxist, I'm a communist and I support the experiments in socialism that I've done thus far, and here's why, right? You're way off the map. You know, like if you if you go around saying I'm a Marxist in academia, okay, right? I mean, it's going to raise some eyebrows and whatever. But if you go around saying you should read Lenin, you should read Mao, you should read Stalin, right? You are going to hear some loud, appalled gasps. You know, <laughs> like that's that's going to be the reaction. You know, and people are going to be like, "You are a crank." You know, I mean, that's just that that's the attitude in academia. Um, I mean, I can tell you that just from working inside that system for, for most of my career. Um, I did leave for five years and ran a nonprofit. Uh, you know, one of the one of the things I do outside of teaching economics is I teach meditation. So I ran a nonprofit uh, with my, my father, my stepmother, um, that's about meditation, self-development and stuff. So, you know, I, I haven't always been inside of academia, but most of my career I have been. Um, so when I found that there was communist Twitter, you know, I was like, what, this is exists. This is for real. You know, like, um, this is amazing, you know? Um, and it's so different from the academic Marxism that I had studied. Uh, it is, it's people, you know, from all different walks of life, right. Um, mostly educated themselves on, on this stuff. Um, and I think that is fantastic, you know, like that's something that I want to support, you know. Um, I don't think that my academic training is any better or worse than any other than any other background, you know, like that's not what this is about, right? I mean, this is about the proletariat, you know, which is the majority of people, right? The vast majority realizing 
we're a class, you know, and we have class interests and let's advance those interests, you know, and what does that look like, right? Um, instead of taking on the interests of the very rich, right? I mean, that's what we're encouraged to do. So, you know, that's, that's kind of like how I came at tweeting and posting, right? Like I, um, I, I don't know, I think of it as kind of a young person's game is what I think of, you know, but, but like I, I've, I've entered the game late in life and, uh, you know, um, but that's, that's why, right? Because I wanted to, you know, contribute to this in some way. Um, and, and then it's like, you know, I, I knew that that post can be a little bit provocative, but I didn't think it would necessarily leave my circle, you know, like I have a circle of fans. Um, and that one just, I think it was the, the part that really triggered people was when I said Stalin is a great listener, you know, and I got a lot of like, hate retweets and being like, well, he killed millions, but at least he was a great listener like that. Right. Like, <laughs> this is like uh, the reason I said that is because it's important to challenge every single thing that is said about Stalin, because it's 99.99% lies, you know? So we have this idea that like Stalin was some kind of, listen to a single thing that somebody else said and somebody tried to say something good luck like that right like and that's not true at all you know like you, you know we, we have lots and lots of you know records of discussions you know witnesses so and stalin is often the last person to say what they thought of something right and this is even before stalin was you know stalin right like supreme leader sort of vibe right because stalin has a long history in the bolshevik party right um, so, you know, I said that knowing it's going to be triggering, but you know, you can never know when something goes viral, you know, I'm not, I'm not in control of that. Um, that's not necessarily the tweet I would have chosen, but I'll, I'll stand behind it. You know, whatever. I did a bunch of follow-up tweets because I was like, oh my God, I'm getting, first of all, millions of impressions on this tweet. You know, it got something like 20 million impressions. So that's a long reach, you know, like, um. And I got, I don't know, 15,000 replies or something like that. I couldn't sort through them all. Um, well, overwhelmingly hostile. Uh, but I got some very favorable ones, too. Um, that was the kind of split, you know? It was like people were like, wow, yeah, that's fantastic, right? And a lot of people were like, you monster, you know? Because that's the extent of the lies that are told about Stalin personally and Soviet history more generally. But yeah, the part about Stalin being a good listener, that, that part did surprise me as well. Um, and <laughs> after you mentioned it, um, I was thinking about it, and I know that there was um, a report that was done after World War II where it was like the Soviet generals wrote a report, and so did the Nazi generals. And the difference was the Soviet generals felt like they were able to win the war because Stalin actually learned to take kind of a back seat and was listening to, you know, what, what they had to offer. So I think that might be kind of evidence of, of what you're, what you're talking about there. But, um, I will yeah. add that it's cool to see what, um, you said about communist Twitter, because there does seem to be a, this disconnect sometimes maybe between the more academic Marxists and your casual, you know, communists who generally end up on Twitter. Um, and oh, yeah. I think one of the big it's gaps, the class that divide to, too, mm -hmm. you know, Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I think um, the Stalin and Mao and talking about Lenin kind of thing um, is part of where that divide goes. Um, I know people like um, Dr. Grover Fur has talked about what he calls the anti-Stalin paradigm. Um, I don't know if you've heard of his term before, but, you know, he's saying in academia, there's this unwritten rule that, um, you know, you pretty much don't say anything good about Stalin. Um, and a lot of people don't cross that line. So I, oh, yeah. I think it is notable, but I guess I want to clarify. Um, yeah, you said that you you've been posting on Twitter for um, a couple of years now, but um, are you saying that that was probably your first post that was made um, defending Stalin particularly? No, I've done tons. I've done tons. <laughs> oh, okay. That's the funny thing. Um, right. Yeah, I, I've I've done lots like that. Um, I mean, I well, because I realized I I realized that it was important to study the history and and have a different vibe about that history right like here's how my here's how some of my professors were you know like i i studied at uh university of massachusetts amherst i was lucky enough to study with uh richard wolf uh and stephen resnick who has now passed away um 
Wolf is still very much with us, though. I mean, he's and he's a major figure uh, on the left these days. Uh, he retired from from UMass and uh, started Democracy at Work, and you know became a a popular YouTube presence. And you know, so I was I'm very happy to see that. Uh, and um, you know, R Rick Wolf is a a, a mentor to me. Uh, you know, taught me a huge amount. You know, I, I consider him a friend. Uh, so, you know, I, um, I was aware that you know, okay, there there it's possible for people to you know be out there and kind of build a platform or build a, a following around this content. You know, like that, that there's an interest in it. There's an openness to it, and that this feels different than it felt 30 years ago, you know, like when I was kind of like just getting into studying it myself. Um, it had, it was a very different feel around that. There's also like different possibilities now, right? Because of the internet and because of, you know, the how much easier it is to have a channel to, you know, have, have a public presence that is outside of like the commercialized media. Right. Um, so that that was kind of like what I, what I saw, but then it's like people people talking about Soviet history or talking about Stalin, they always approach it in the, I think this weak way, you know, saying, well, you know, oh, there was a lot of mistakes and a lot of bad stuff, and da 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 da, da. but you know, he did industrialize the country and he did da 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 da, da. and it's like, okay, that's fine for like how scholars talk to other scholars, but that's not good messaging, you know, like that's not. That's not what the right does, you know. The right encapsulates it into some easy to understand talking points, you know. <laughs> and you don't find that, like you don't find that on the left. You find these long, dense, you know, like multifaceted, complex analyses, right? Um, that's great, but sometimes you need to simplify things, you know. Sometimes you need to be like, look, there's a fucking war going on right now, you know, and that war is between the bourgeoisie and everyone else, you know? I mean, this is a tiny group whose wealth depends on the violent domination of humanity, you know? And they want to tell us that's for the good, you know? They're destroying the earth. I mean, it's it's like, it's let, like let's, let's just make it that stark, you know? Um, and then they want us, they want to tell us that what they have to say about socialism and communism is the truth. I mean, it's not, first of all, it's not, right? Like you study the actual facts. Um, so I think I think it's important to take a more assertive stance right out of the gate, you know? You don't say, oh, I'm so sorry because uh, here's what Stalin amounted. No, right? You say, in the proper context, what you see is unbelievably humane leadership, right? Which has incredibly powerful results for the average person, right? I mean, if socialism had been, you know, like most governments, you know, most political figures lie, right? They lie their asses off. You know, they say, oh, we're going to help everybody, blah, 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 right? And then they get in power and do fucking nothing, right? I mean, that's a long, long story. That's every bourgeois politician ever, right? Um, and was that true of socialism as well? Uh, no, that wasn't, right? I mean, you saw some of the most important human-centered development in the shortest period of time ever in history, you know? If it hadn't been that way, I would probably be a lot more apologetic, you know? I'd probably be like, well, I think socialism can still work, eh, and like that, right? Yeah, <laughs> but because the record's actually so strong, you know? I'm like, look at the record, you know? Use data, use logic, you know? Like, that's what we should be doing, and instead, we don't know, you know? Like, we we've, We've accepted the frame, you know, which is like, you know, that that socialism doesn't work or something like that. Uh, it's nonsense. Right. And we were discussing before about how there are definite metrics that you can use to measure a society like the human development index or GDP. Right. And so like these societies have demonstrably succeeded in building a more equitable, more egalitarian form of organization versus, you know, a capitalist society. Yes, absolutely. And I think it's good to study those metrics. Um, you know, it, it's also good, the metrics are not the end of the story, right? Because a metric exists within a context, but of course we should use them, right? I mean, we should say, well, what was life expectancy, for example, right? I mean, that's, 
that's kind of a big one, you know, because like, should not the economy serve human needs? And if it's serving human needs, then shouldn't the average age right, like go, increase, right? I mean, this is what life expectancy is, right? It's the, the average age at death. So shouldn't that increase, right? I mean, like, shouldn't there be, and one of the most powerful ways to make life expectancy increase is to decrease infant mortality, right? And infant mortality is, a horrible thing that happens, right? I mean, this is, it, so that, that statistic is uh, the number of children under age one, right? Infants um, who die, right? They die in their first year of life. So if you think about those two statistics being related, right? Like a child who dies at 0.5 years old, right? Versus an adult that dies at 75, let's say, right? I mean, like when you average those two, right? Oh, okay, wow, you're getting pretty close to 38 for life expectancy, right? So the more infants die, the worse the society looks for, for life expectancy, right? Uh, so, but infant mortality is a very significant statistic just on its own because it's a tragic, horrible thing, right? I mean, each, each infant that dies, uh, you know, like that had a big negative impact on the life of the parents, right? I mean, um, it's awful. Anybody who has kids knows, you know, that that's a, that's a tragedy and society should do as much as it can to reduce that. Now, how do you reduce it? Well, it's pretty straightforward, you know, like you provide basic healthcare for people, you know, like you, 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 you deliver children, let's say, you know, with some medical attention available if it's needed, right? Like that's how you, that's how you make an impact, right? I mean, it's not rocket science, you know, it's, it's basic primary medical care. Um, and if you look at a lot of these countries, I mean, you look at, let's say the big, the big socialist countries, right? China, um, the, uh, the USSR, or we could look at Cuba since that's, that's timely right now. Um, these are societies that massively poured resources into the very thing I'm talking about, right? Basic primary medical care. Um, not the super fancy, you know, oh, the, the MRI and the, you know, plastic surgery and whatever, right? Not that, not that level of it, the basic level, which is serving the needs of the average person, right? So, you know, that's good, right? I mean, like we're in this debate in the United States right now, right? Like, should we have Medicare for all? I mean, you know, we go from a democratic primary in which every single candidate supports that, right? To okay, well, now Biden's elected, what are the odds of Medicare for all or whatever getting enacted? I'd say they're pretty low, you know? Um, and you right. know, that is, that's the bourgeois state, right? Like bourgeois state says it wants to do these things and doesn't do it, right? Uh, socialist state is very different, right? This, the socialist state, I mean, we're just looking at their actual record, right? Not what they say, what did they do, right? Well, they massively poured resources into healthcare. So, you know, I think that's, a fair thing, right? Like we, we don't listen to what they say. Look at the results, you know, and we look at the results relative to the capabilities. How rich is that country, right? How many challenges does it have? How many countries does it have trying to invade it, let's say, right? Um, all of that plays a role in terms of what is the society's capability to improve people's lives, okay? We have a much greater capability in the United States than what the Soviet Union had because, I mean, we just have, you know, we, we have more wealth, right? Um, we don't have the kind of, you know, disruptive events. We don't have, you know, the world's largest army invading us, right? This, this. So results matter and results relative to capabilities matter. Yeah, I, I think those are all really important points. Um, you know, before you, you spoke on taking an unapologetic approach towards talking about this history. And, you know, I think, you know, maybe what stands out about you as an academic um, versus maybe other Marxist academics is I think you do realize the importance of like of proletarian history, because we can show that these things have been done in the past. You know, we can show that this isn't just something where we're saying we're going to do it better. We're saying that we actually have the evidence that relative in these societies, they were able to, um, you know, massively increase their, um, you know, life expectancy and healthcare and such like that. Um, right. So, yeah, I do think defending proletarian history is um, something that um, is very important. Um, but I also wanted to um, talk about 
I guess I wanted to um, get your reaction. Um, you know, we were talking before about um, what brought this on in your tweet that became viral. Um, what was your reaction when Fox News picked it up the following day? Um, were you surprised yeah. by that? Or um, I mean, in the article, I will say I thought they might um, be coming at you a little more, but really they were just like, oh, here's they what didn't. he said. I know. <laughs> yeah, I guess they were just assuming people would just know that this is bad or something like that without having to give context. But um, yeah, what was your reaction to that? Well, <laughs> I was like, "Damn, I'm on I'm on Fox News. I'm now I'm Professor Stalin." Okay, um, <laughs> you know, I I think my initial reaction was was like, um, "This is a lot of heat," you know, and I, you know, as my as my like Twitter profile has grown, you know, I mean, it's so it's one thing. Like when I started getting back on Twitter, I was off Twitter for years. I mean, my account goes back to, I think, 2009 or something like that, but I didn't really use it for very much. You know, I had a lot of, you know, because I have this other like kind of health development meditation sort of interest, right? I had I had a lot of followers that were more in that space, you know, and less into politics. Um, and I got back on it because of, uh, you know, burner Twitter, right? Like during the during the Bernie campaign, I was like, this is a great place to go for news about the campaign. I mean, like, you know, you want stuff that's breaking, Twitter's the place. Uh, and then I was like, oh, now wait, there's communist Twitter? That's a that's hundred times better than Bernie Twitter, <laughs> you know? So it was, you know, it's like, for me, it's a kind of a process. Um, and, you know, posting as well, just seeing like, well, what what is the state of the discourse? What, you know, what issues are people discussing? I mean, I stay on it because I learn a lot from it, you know? Um, and my background is a lot more theoretical because this is kind of like how, you know, you get trained as an academic, right? Your, your interest is in theory, especially in economics. Economics, very, very mathematical, right? Um, so, you know, you, you do all this pure theory and then you, you don't really spend a lot of time with concrete politics. You don't spend a lot of time with like, what are the contradictions of just, you know, running a nation, you know? I mean, like how much, um, how much progress towards socialism are you going to be able to make given that you just have to defend yourself? Like every nation has to defend themselves. I mean, you know, you can call your system whatever the hell you want, right? But here's the fact, right? The fact is you exist in a hostile world where other nations, you know, would love to dominate you, right? And maybe they'll dominate you by conquering you, right? And, you know, killing the leadership or whatever, that's bad, you know? Lots of cases of that. Maybe they'll dominate you through trade. Maybe they'll dominate you through legal means. You know, um, and is, what what do you do if you've been the victim of that historically, right? I mean, like, how do you how do you break out of the colonial yoke, right? How do you how do you do that? You know, um, so context is key. Now, I did forget what the actual question was. I'm not sure if I've answered it. Oh, no, I think those are good points. Um, yeah, I was asking about um, your reaction to the Fox News um, bit. Oh, yes, the Fox News thing. Well, yeah. okay, so this, <laughs> is, this, was, this was funny because, you know, it says in there that they reached out to me for comment and I didn't get to them back to them by, by press time. And that's true. My, my message box got, like, totally overwhelmed. My, mo my notifications got overwhelmed, you know. I mean, like, um, you know, you get a notification every time – you know, you get a like or whatever, I, like I got 60,000 likes in the three days or something, you know? So I was like pretty, uh, I was like, Oh my God, you know, my notifications are no longer usable. But I read that when I read the article, I was like, um, it's actually pretty good. You know, like it's, <laughs> it's, I think Fox has a certain narrative they want to push, which is communist professors, you know, run academia and they're indoctrinating the youth like this. Right. That's absolute and utter nonsense. You know, uh, ac academia is uh, a venue of the establishment. You know, it is it is pro capitalist, right? The what you find in academia is you find um, believers in the technocratic elite, believers in um, in the idea that capitalism can be reformed as long as it's done wisely. You know, as long as it's done by smart people. You know, it's a flattering view for professors. Um, Professors are not big believers in the idea that the proletariat should run society. You know, like that's just not a popular idea in academia. I mean, I don't know what to say, you know, but Fox likes to have that narrative. They like to stir up fear with it. So I was like, I did reach out. I reached back to the 
the writer and I said, you know, you want to do an interview with me? Okay, I'll do one with you. You know, um, wasn't a bad article. Um, and, but I think we, ne we never did that. We had some back and forth, but we never did an interview or whatever. I got other, I got other hostile press things. I got, I got contacted by Turning Point USA and they were like, Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. They're like, we have a professor watch list. We want to like ask you some questions. And they like ask me these questions. And I'm like, that's the kind of thing I'm not even going to reply to, you know, that's not a legitimate media organization. That's like, you know, a McCarthyite, you know, putting professors on lists. Come on. You know, like, yeah. That doesn't even have an upside to it. Right. Like Fox news has an upside, which is that they have, you know, a long reach. Right. So, you know, I get featured on that. It raises my profile somewhat, you know, I mean, I got about 5,000 followers from, from the whole thing, you know? Um, so, it's a contradiction, right? Like capitalism cannot step on communism without at the same time, you know, uplifting it, right? Because what are you doing? You're talking about it all the time, right? You're talking about, well, God, it's so important that people are not communists. And pe some people are going to be like, huh, what is communism? Let me study this, right? <laughs> it's kind of like a dare in their approach to just say no. <laughs> just say no to communism. Right? Just, exactly. <laughs> just say no to communism. And it just makes the kids more and more curious. Yeah, yeah. That's the contradiction, right? Capitalism produces its own grave diggers, as, as Marx said. <laughs> but um, yeah, that that's actually one of the things I wanted to ask you is like, are the Turning Point USA folks on campus just up in arms? Do they have their tiki torches out and, you know, they're calling for you to be fired or whatever? Because I imagine like getting on Fox News and stuff that brings that kind of heat. Yeah. Um, on At RCC, uh, no. Usually, I mean, what you have here, I think, and this is true everywhere in colleges, is you have people that come in from the outside. You know, you have people who are, they're not students, you know, like they're just, you know, they're, they're provocateurs or they're, they believe that this is happening or whatever. And, you know, like my department chair gets the occasional note uh, from some random person that's like, I'm just curious as to why RCC can have a communist professor. I mean, blah, 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 like this, right? Like, and, you know, so that my chair has been quite good about writing back and saying, uh, it's not appropriate for me to comment about individual faculty members, but I can tell you that every faculty member here, uh, you know, that's hired at RCC goes through a rigorous, you know, interview process, a national search, a training, a evaluation, all this stuff, right? So. You know, in case people think that, you know, I don't know what, like that, you, you know, you don't have to to uh, be vetted or something like that, you know, that um, that they hire anybody or something like this, you know, like um, I do have a PhD in economics from, you know, like a, you know, an unknown uh, institution uh, and you know, like you, you are allowed to have different opinions from the mainstream, you know, like, um, and I think the college has been pretty good about that, although it did it did cause me some anxiety, you know, like you, you never like, I have tenure, you know, um, but you never like people publicly calling for you to be fired, you know, um, and and you wonder like, how much heat can the, would the, would the college be able to withstand, you know, like, like, um, I'm pretty well connected there. We have a pretty strong union, you know, I, um, you know, that's, and that's good. And I know a lot of the administrative figures. so. I'm, I'm not an unknown quantity there, um, but, you know, you think, well, what if a senator called them, right? What if a congressperson was, was saying, you know, like, that's a lot, that's the heat of a different magnitude, right? That hasn't happened yet. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, th that's, that's the contradiction of having these views, you know, like, hey, I understand why you guys are not showing your faces, <laughs> you know, yeah, because you can get fired for just having this opinion, right? I mean, like, that's a reality. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, and, you know, you mentioned earlier um, about, like, the the whole cultural Marxist idea and how Fox, they're obviously playing into that. They are they were almost saying, look, we caught one of them in the wild. Here's one of these Stalinist professors or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. So, like, um, yeah, it, it is just interesting to see because – I know there was another video going around maybe about a week or two ago um, where it was a woman talking about critical race theory. And she said that she was um, she escaped the cultural revolution and she was saying this critical race theory stuff is like worse than the cultural revolution. 
Um, so of course, Fox, they are pushing this narrative. So like, yeah. So when your article popped up, I was like, okay, this is like the same kind of thing going on here. They're, they're pushing a narrative obviously, but it is pretty insane to see. And it's pretty deceptive. It's pretty dishonest. You know, I mean, like, <laughs> like, uh, like pe people are getting um, fired and purged and thrown in jail because of their lack of adherence to critical race theory. That is, I'm sorry, that's dead wrong. You know, like, I mean, show me one person for whom that's true, right? I mean, it's that wrong, you know, like it's, it's just an absurd, uh, absurd view. Uh, critical race theory, I mean, I, this actually gave me pause, you know, because like I'm, I'm, you know, right, coming from academia, right? And so we take these terms seriously, right? Like, like, what is that? How would you summarize that, right? And I'm like, um, it's actually kind of a relatively new term, you know, like, and so I, I had to kind of look into this and be like, what does this even mean, like, as a body of thought? And the best I can determine um, is it means that racism plays uh, an incredibly deep and long-standing role in forming U.S. institutions, the way that political power is held, economic results. And I'm like, if that's what it means, it's undisputably true, right? I mean, like racism, white supremacy casts a very long shadow across American society, right? Um, I mean, across global society. But if we're just sticking with the U.S., definitely, right, incredibly significant uh, in terms of U.S. history up to the present day, right? So the fact that this has become some kind of boogeyman and is, and you're using this weird capitalized thing, right? It's, it really reminds me of the Nazis with their phrases, which they like to capitalize, right? Which were Judeo-Bolshevism and cultural Marxism and stuff like this, right? I mean, you know, which we still hear today. I, I'm like, I cannot believe that the old right or whatever the hell, the reactionaries, whatever they call themselves, are tr are getting away with basically bringing back Nazi ideas and not really even changing them, you know? That actually leads nicely into a question I wanted to ask you. Uh, if you've ever heard of Dr. Jordan Peterson and all of the quackery uh, revolving around him. Yeah, yeah, I heard of Jordan Peterson. <laughs> because... I, I blame him with repopularizing the term cultural Marxism because that was the first um, that was the first individual that I ever heard that term from. And you know, you're right; it goes back to the Nazis using cultural Bolshevism and Judeo Bolshevism as as these sort of buzzwords to attack it. And uh, I was telling FVK a little while ago, you know, it was just a few years ago you heard the right wingers uh, whining all about social justice, social justice. And before that it was political correctness. And right. so these terms, these ideas have ways of changing terms, but the general trend of the ideas remain the same. It's like white reaction against politics that are remotely critical of the U S empire or of white supremacy or of capitalism. It's all branded as the other, the scary other, and we can't listen to it. And we can't let our kids listen to it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a very weak position really, you know, because like, you know, if you, if you really study history, I think this is the funny thing about, about Peterson too. Like when you, when you listen to what he says about socialism, um, it's not very detailed, you know, I mean, it's, it's not different from like what the average pundit says, you know, like, we're like, well, socialism does just doesn't work because, you know, human nature, humans are selfish and hierarchical. That's the, that's human nature. And it's like, you know, what we call that in academia, that's called a faith-based argument. I mean, like, show me what human nature is, you know, like you putting a lot of stock in that idea, right? Okay. Show it to me, right? Show me human nature. Well, of course you cannot, right? Because you know, what we see if we look at human beings is we see human beings vary a lot, right? Like, now you want to tell me that there's an essential set of qualities that human beings have always had and will always have? Okay, well, could you also tell me how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Because that's the kind of thing you're talking about, right? Like, you have not observed every human being, right? I mean, you where's the experimental, where's any kind of evidence that that's true, right? You're not, you're not, you're not on an evidence basis. You're, you're on 
you know, as long as people believe that, right? It's it's the same as the like, you know, Enlightenment era proofs of the existence of God, you know. The way that you prove that God exists is you start with the idea that there's an all-powerful being out there. But if you start with that idea, you know, like you've already given the game away, right? Like that's the, you know, that's that's where kind of I'm like somebody like Peterson, I mean, and, and by the way, a psychologist, a psychologist can certainly weigh in. I mean, anybody can weigh in, right? But but if you're going to weigh in on that way, in, in that way, like not only not look at literally any of the evidence, right? Um, but but come at it with this like faith-based idea. I mean, how the hell can any real scholar take that seriously? Any and any anyone who uses critical thinking, you know, like you don't you don't need to be a scholar to be like, look, that dude just does not know anything about this topic, you know, um, and. And that's fine. You can say a bunch of stuff that you don't know anything about, but other people can also challenge it. Right, right. And yeah, the human nature argument, it, it is when you start pressing them on it, it depends on the person. But a lot of times you'll figure out that it's almost like they believe capitalism has existed forever. Like their idea of human nature is like people trade things and, you know, that's just the way it has always worked. So it's almost like yeah. yeah, human nature is in capitalism and it's always existed, um, <laughs> which is pretty insane. But um, they but do yeah. say that they do say that. I mean, you know, there isn't really. And I think this comes out of a mainstream economic theory, too, because mainstream economic theory does not talk about capitalism per se. It talks a lot about markets. Right. So if you take like a course in microeconomics, let's say, right, like that's that's mainstream or. You know, I mean, I use the term bourgeois, you know, especially on Twitter. <laughs> That's bourgeois economics, right? Bourgeois economics tells you markets equal, basically equal capitalism. They don't they don't like the word capitalism, though. They just they like studying markets and equilibrium. Those are their words, you know. Um, the thing is, markets are very, very old. You know, markets predate human history. You know, I mean, some of the first written history that we have, I mean, back when you were writing stuff down on clay tablets and firing those tablets and whatever, some of the first history we have of that kind is about debt, you know? I mean, like, and that just tells you money existed at the time, right? Thousands of years ago. Um, debt existed, you know, people were, were lending to one another. So is this capitalism, right? I mean, like, and of Marxism, of course, would say no, right? I mean, capitalism is a thing that arises at a particular time, right? When wage labor becomes the predominant economic relationship, right? The, the predominant way that people have of making a living, right? They're workers. And then there's a class of capitalists who buy their labor power, right? Which is sold in a free market for that labor power uh, and, and then pay them a wage. And that wage is less than the value that the worker produces, right? Now, this is new. This is only about 300 years old. So even though there's, you know, as a dominant structure, right, as a way that most people make a living, like we go back a thousand years, was there money? Yes. Was there debt? Yes. Right. Were there, were there merchants? Yes. Uh, but was the average person earning a wage? No, absolutely not. Right. Were there some people earning wages? Yes. Right. That's, you know, wages is an old thing as well, right? Was it the dominant social relationship? No, absolutely not. So there's a lot of just, you know, I mean, there's so many layers of propaganda here, you know, even, and those who are proponents of capitalism often have a very poor and shallow understanding of what it is that they're even supporting. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, they, they definitely have an aversion to defining capitalism as um, a system of wage labor, which is really one of the defining features of it. Um, and yeah. yeah, I think that focus on markets is, um, from what I've been able to see, um, is like where they put most of their focus. Um, but yeah, that, I think that covers most of, um, what we were wanting to discuss with you um, today, Dr. Bear. Um, I don't know if you wanted to make any final comments or maybe shout out your YouTube channel or anything, um, before we get out of here. Um, anything sure. Like yeah. Um, I, my, I'm on, if you, if, if you Google my name, you'll, you'll find me on, on YouTube. Uh, I have a channel there. Um, I, I have lectures on, on political economy. Uh, I also teach meditation each week on there for folks that are interested in that. Uh, my Twitter handle is, you know, you can also search for my name and find me on Twitter. 
Um, I have a Patreon page if people want to support the work that I do. I'm, I'm working on a book right now uh, about Xinjiang, China, the issue of the Uyghurs. Uh, I want to comment on one thing that seems like it's just died down a little bit recently, uh, and that is the situation in Cuba. Um, you know, this has a lot of implications for how we understand socialism now, you know, and the way that we're taught about this, the way that we're supposed to understand socialism is, oh, this is an authoritarian system and it, you know, they, they don't have voting and that's why it's, that's why it's bad, you know. We need to have voting and we want to, oh, these people are, you know, pro-democracy and whatever, right? Um, and, you know, this is uh, a false narrative, right? I mean, like it's, it's you know, it, it confuses the process with the, with the results, right? Um, you know, what, it, what are the results of, of democracy? You know, like what do people generally want? What are they advocating for? Like, you know, there's, there's actual issues here, right? Like, like, you know, you ask people what they want, right? What are the, what are the problems that they face in their lives? You know, um, I mean, if you ask Americans, it's, it's pretty clear, you know, like, hey, they, there's lots of people that don't have access to healthcare, you know, or they have, or they have bad access to healthcare, right? A access which might bankrupt them, right? Which in fact is the leading, single leading cause of bankruptcy, right? Is medical expenses, this category called medical bankruptcy. It's horrible, right? So, you know, we're told that, oh, the reason that Cuba's bad is because they don't have a democratic process. First of all, that's not actually true, right? You know, socialist countries have a tremendous amount of contact with, you know, the party and the people at all levels, you know? They have different mechanisms. They have, they might have a single party, um, but this does not, you know, having two parties does not make you democratic, right? I mean, you know, and it's kind of amazing, like how little thought we spend on that. So what 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 happened in Cuba? Just you know, like over the last like week and a half, right? Is you have these this you know this SOS Cuba thing happening on social media. You have you know you have some small demonstrations, um, and then people are like, oh my God, Cuba's rising up, right? And it's like, no, this is an op, you know, like you look at the, look at the video, right? You have a few hundred people protesting and then you have counter protests, right? People, pr people supporting the Cuban government. And these are in the thousands. I mean, these are massive, massive rallies, right? People are, are chanting, uh, I am Fidel. I mean, like the, the Cuban socialism is unbelievably popular in Cuba because it has massively improved people's lives. People are aware of that, right? What's unpopular in Cuba is the U.S. embargo, right? So a lot of people have pointed out, okay, the U.S. has been trying to economically strangle uh, this tiny island nation, which was basically in, you know, in all the ways that matter, a colony of the United States before the revolution. Uh, and then we're saying, oh, now Cubans want to be free. Well, you know, the hypocrisy of that, right? Like if you want Cuba to be free, uh, and the embargo, you know, I mean, like, that's the thing that all Cubans are, are calling for, except for the descendants of the wealthy who fled the island, right? That's the only voices we hear in the U.S. media. So, you know, this was a thing that I was active on just recently because, you know, I don't like to see a bunch of lies being told <laughs> about, about socialism, period, you know, like wherever, wherever that is. Yeah, I think that's definitely very important. Um, it's definitely unfortunate to see um, the U.S. media trying to manufacture consent for some type of regime change, basically. And, you know, unfortunately, it seems like that's kind of where they're pressing as far as, um, you know, building this narrative. They're trying to say this is what they want. They would actively accept, you know, the United States coming in and helping bring a quote unquote democratic change and such. Uh -huh. But but yeah, I think that's definitely important. I'm glad you you mentioned that here. Um, but yeah, definitely check out Dr. Bear's YouTube channel. He has a great he has two great videos on um, um, political economy in the USSR and China in particular. Um, I'm making my way through those videos, so definitely give those a listen. But um, yeah, um, thanks again for joining us today, Dr. Bear. Um, yeah, we will definitely look forward to talking to you in the future. Absolutely. Thanks so much for for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks sure. for coming.